Great. Thank you, everybody, again for joining us. As Meredith mentioned, I'll just do a quick update on what I am seeing with COVID-19 locally, and then we will hear your questions. So uh, as you can probably imagine, variants of concern have been a big consideration for us over the last little while. And I believe I showed you this graph last time, really comparing what the United Kingdom has gone through compared to Ontario. And I showed several other international comparisons where you saw a big spike leading to a third wave after regions reopened at a relatively high rate and gave opportunity for those variants to start to spread. And we're starting to see it in Canada as well. Um, most notably was the example I showed with Newfoundland here, but we're also starting to see small upticks in some of the other provinces. And if we take a look at what's happening with daily cases here in Ontario, this is really the pattern that we are seeing. I pointed out last time that we were just starting to see a little bit of flattening last week, and we're very much seeing that that is flattened out, and there might be a small increase here in the Ontario daily cases. And you know, early to say for sure if that will be sustained, but if it is, I think everybody can imagine that that could be that similar pattern we saw in the UK, where you come down your second wave, you reopen and then maybe the variants start to take off there. You might be starting to head toward the third wave. Just to show you what the influence of the variants here is, I'm just gonna uh, overlay this graph now, subtracting the variants to see what the pattern would be if we didn't have the variants circulating. And then that looks something like that. And so you can see that there's a bit of a sharper uptick thanks to the variants, that difference there you're seeing is really about the variants. And there's a little bit of a reporting lag of the provincial number, so I can't show it up to today the way I can with our daily cases. And you know, that's I think exactly what the modeling was saying, that we would see the variants basically start to take off and lead to that spike. And we're perhaps starting to see a little bit of that. Now, uh, taking a look at the cumulative uh, COVID cases in Ontario here, um, particularly the variants detected on screening. It's looked like this over the last few uh, weeks. Uh, February 3rd was the point where the province started to routinely test every sample for the variants. And you can, I think, kind of get the appreciation here that the variants are basically picking up steam a little bit. That line isn't just going in a linear fashion. It is slowly starting to accelerate. And if we go to the daily cases, I think you can get an even better sense of that here in Ontario, where it's a little bit noisy. This is a three day rolling average just to try and smooth that out. But you can see that every day we seem to be seeing more and more variants being reported in the province as part of the daily case count. I don't have the last few days here just because of the provincial reporting lag, but one can imagine that's going to continue to go up. And if we're looking at a percentage of our daily cases, it looks something along these lines, where uh, back on January 20th, the province had that point prevalence study where they tested every sample on January 20th to see how much of the variants were around and it came out to 4.4%. Uh, we have a little bit of a lag then where we don't have much data, but since February 3rd, it's been routinely being tested again. And we kind of see this sort of pattern where that percentage of our total cases, which are a variant, are rapidly rising, and they're approaching 20% now, uh, at least as of February 25th, which is the most recent data that the province has released. And so the proportion of variants is very much growing, and they're you know, very swiftly going to become dominant in terms of the proportion of cases that we have of COVID-19. Uh, switching here to take a look now at Niagara. You know, remember last week I talked about how in Niagara we had six positive screens for the variant at that time. And this is what it looks like over time. This is the dates where we initially reported the case and then a few days later we find out it's a variant. I'm tracing it back to the date the case was actually originally reported to us as a positive COVID case, not the few days later when we found out it was a variant. But these were the six cases that we had back last week when we talked. And you know, as you can see, there were six there. What's happened since that last week looks kind of like this, where we've had a substantial number of additional cases screen positive for the variant. We are actually, as of now, up to 33 cases. 
Last couple of days, we haven't seen anything, but that's again because of provincial reporting delay. It's usually a two or three days after we reported the case, we'll find out if it's a variant or not. If we're kind of gonna you know, do a moving average of those numbers to kind of get a feel for what that trend looks like, it's kind of like that where you know, we are dealing with small numbers, so a bit of caution, but it definitely seems to be picking up in terms of the number of cases that are variants. And again, doing that percent uh, of our cases, which are a variant, when the province did that point prevalence, scheme on, uh, uh, point prevalence screen on January 20th, we had zero cases of variant that came out on that January 20th. Um, but now this is kind of what we're looking at. And every day, you know, a proportion of our cases, that's a variant has gone up. And we're now upwards of 15% for the most recent day where we've been able to do that calculation. Uh, and then, you know, going back here, this is, you know, the daily cases in Niagara that we have seen per day and doing similar to what I did earlier with the Ontario data, overlaying what it would look like if we didn't have the variants. You can see right now we are flattening out here in terms of our daily cases. If we didn't have the variants, you can see we might still actually be on a small downward trend, but the variants have the difference between us continuing on a downward trend and us actually having flattened out. And just to show you what these numbers actually boil down to in terms of statistics. So if we're looking at all our cases, we have a reproductive number just about one, which is perfectly consistent with us being flat. And we of course have a large uh, doubling time. If we take out the variants, we actually see our reproductive numbers below one. And that's consistent with us still seeing a small decrease in our non-variant cases. If we're looking then at the variants, you can see that the reproductive number of the variants is quite high. They are growing quickly and their doubling time is 4.4 days, which is consistent with exponential growth. Every four and a half days, we seem to be doubling the number of variants that we have. Caution of course, is that we're dealing with relatively small numbers here. So these numbers could be a little bit exaggerated just because of that. But I think it's overall clear that the variants are now what are driving our cases flattening out as opposed to continuing the decline that we are seeing earlier. And you know, this was exactly what the provincial modeling said. We would see our non-variant cases come down. We would see our variant cases start to climb. And as they grow large enough, they would start to dominate and we would start to see that upwards trend. Now I talked about how in Niagara, we're at about 16% of our cases are now variants. In the province, it's over 20%. The Ontario Science Table released their latest modeling last Thursday, and this is what they are projecting is, you know, what they've seen and what they're projecting. And they're saying that that provincial number will go from being about 20% to about 40% in the second week of March. And of course, next week is the second week of March. And so these are coming up very quickly on top of us. This is the Ontario Science Table again, doing modeling in terms of how that percentage of your cases that's variant grows over time and comparing Ontario here, which is the bars, to what are the lines that we saw in other parts of the world, which saw the variants more quickly and Ontario definitely seems to be tracking. And that's where they're getting that uh, modeling that if you're at 20% here, a couple of weeks later, you're at 40%, a couple of weeks later, you're over 60%. And that's perhaps the trajectory that we are headed on. And of course, as that happens, you see the rebound in cases here that they have modeled is likely to happen. In terms of hospitalizations, because Ontario opened up uh, you know, relatively early in terms of where our case counts are, we actually hadn't got our hospitalizations back down to something more reflective of where things were in the summer or the early fall. And that is now flattened out as our cases are flattening out and uh, starting to go up a little bit in Ontario. And if those variants take off and we do see that third wave as expected, there very much could be that increase. Now the province has made the policy decision that they are going to proceed with reopening despite these risks being presented by their own expert bodies. Uh, that being said, they are remaining cautious that you know, the return, this is a return to the framework. It's not a return to normal. And they're continuing to emphasize that to avoid that third wave that the modeling does project, that this is gonna require everybody really practicing rigor on their part in terms of limiting a spread of infection. You know, they, um, the Minister Elliott you know, uses the same language every day and it talks about physical distancing, masks, uh, washing hands, staying home as much as possible. 
travel for essential purposes only. And I think it's really those last two comments that we really need to take at heart. If this reopening is going to work and we avoid the third wave we've seen in other parts of the world, we absolutely need to do these last two elements and really almost live as if we're in still in a mindset that we were in the lockdown living under a stay at home order. We're gonna stay home as much as possible. We're only gonna travel for essential purposes. Yes, some additional businesses and many of these are open. We can partake in them very briefly if we essentially, if there's essential reasons to do so, but we really should be avoiding that as much as possible to stay home. And that's the only way I believe we're gonna be able to avoid that third wave. And so that's, I think, the outlook I'm seeing in terms of Ontario and in Niagara. It is not a positive story with the variants. It's thus far looking like we are tracking where the modeling has said we would go if we did an aggressive reopening. And unfortunately, I think it's down to our personal behavior as citizens now, whether or not we avoid that third wave. And so with that, I'll turn it over for some questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Herji. If you could stop sharing your screen, then I can go back to the group view. Excellent. Okay, um, so we're gonna do a round table of questions like we've done in the past, and we'll go in order of Penny, then Bonnie, um, uh, I believe Richard Harley, then Ludwig, and then Gord. So that's how we're starting off. So Penny, I will uh, turn it over to you. Sorry, am I unmuted now? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about the uh, time lag with the reporting of variants. I understand Dr. Herji has explained that to us that that's the, the way of the provincial testing of the variants, but are there some efforts being made or is there any commitment with the province to speed up that testing or is that something that we're always just gonna have to live with that we will be behind on the reporting of variants? Yeah, I think there's two parts to this. There's the initial screening test they do to whether or not it is a variant. And then there's a second part, which is the actual sequencing of the nuclear material, which positively confirms it's a variant and identifies which type of variant it is. That screening test is starting to become pretty good. We're getting a result back on that a couple days later after we find out a case is a COVID-19 case. And I think we're probably not gonna see it go up much more than that. The province has talked about they would like to maybe try and move it from about a two-day turnaround to a one-day turnaround, which would certainly be good. But I think even with a two-day turnaround, that's not too bad. Where there's then a really big lag is with the sequencing, which you know I think the machine alone, if you immediately put in the machine, it takes a week for that test to run. And I think the province doesn't necessarily have the capacity to be able to test the total number of cases that we have for sequencing at that speed. And so that seems to be lagging behind a bit. I think we're you know, about two to two and a half weeks behind on getting those sequencing results right now. The province has talked about scaling up their capacity to do that, but there's certainly no commitments and they haven't really given us what the target of how quickly they want it to be turned around. I think the best case scenario is we'd be looking at at least seven days for that turnaround, just given that's how long the machine takes to actually do that work. And follow up, Penny? Uh, so Dr. Herji, um, you said uh, a one, one or two day uh, lag for um, confirming, um, but not the sequencing. Is that in, in terms of being able to calculate how quickly uh, cases are growing and which are variants, is that a concern? Or you, may, you sounded as if you think that that's probably the best it's gonna get and uh, something you can work with. Yeah, you know, uh, what the province is doing is as soon as a case tests positive for COVID-19, it's immediately sent off for that screening. So within a day to two days, we are getting that result. Obviously, if we have it a day earlier, that's great. That gives us a one more day head start in terms of following up with a case isolating, so following up with a case in terms of uh, re-interviewing them with a greater intensity around varying concerns. But you know, a case is reported to us, we're isolating them, we're isolating their contacts, that's already being done. So 
So learning about whether or not it's a variant doesn't have that much effect on what our follow-up is going to be. We do redo it and double check that we haven't missed anything, but I think you know one to two days isn't too big a difference. We are able to get a sense of what's going on in the community as I've shared with you here today. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Penny. Uh, Bonnie, over to you next. Hi, Dr. Hirji. Um, Hi, I just wanted to confirm the number. I'm just uh, double checking. You said 32 cases of the variant now under investigation in Niagara? Uh, it's 33. 33, okay. And, and all of those are positive on the screen as opposed to the sequencing yet, but as we understand, the screening is almost 100% accurate. Okay, good to know. And um, just a follow-up from the last time we were speaking, those 33 cases all linked to any travel exposure or are we now seeing community transmission? Uh, the vast majority are linked to travel either within the GTA or even outside of Ontario or indirectly linked where, for example, one person is linked to travel and then say family members of theirs become sick because they've had contact. There are a couple of cases though where we haven't found that link. So there is a possibility there is some community transmission occurring. We're still doing further investigation to see if we can find the source for those infections, because if we do find that, we'll hopefully be able to contain further spread more. But there is a possibility there is some community transmission because we have seen at least a couple of cases where you have not yet found the source. Is there a plan to update us on variant cases, whether it be on the website or, or a press release? There's absolutely the plan. We're actually working on an adjustment to our website to have that reported daily out. That'll be coming up later this week. Okay. I have another question, but I have to wait my turn. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. We'll hit you again. Um, okay, Richard Harley, you are up next. Let me unmute you. There you go. Hey, guys. How's it going today? Um, just wanted to uh, touch a little bit more on what Penny was asking there. Um, with the the screening, so we it's a it's about a hundred percent that you know that it is it is a variant, but it's the sequencing that tells you which variant it is. Is that what I'm? That's exactly correct. Okay, right on. That's really the only, only question I had right now so far. Okay, thanks, Richard. Thanks. Um, and Ludwig, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Meredith. Uh, hello, Dr. Herji. Hello, everyone. Um, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Herji, so uh, considering what we know now, 33 presumed very likely variant cases here in the region, um, what does that mean in regards to the emergency break? You know, what, uh, could you talk a bit about where we have to be with uh, the number of variants in order for you to get concerned to the point that you would advocate for just stopping this, reversing it, and because it, it sounds on you like, and in, in, in you know conjunction with the modeling as well, that this is roughly what we were expecting. We've been seeing this for a number of weeks now. So could you talk a bit about what, what your plans are moving forward, observing this situation and what, what you think need to happen in order for you to, to advocate for some sort of more uh, drastic action? Thank you. Yes. So, you know, I have been cautioning all along that we shouldn't be reopening very quickly, obviously as a provincial policy decision to go a different way. And I think we're seeing the fallout of those policy decisions right now. In terms of when I might advocate that the emergency break be used, I'm actually reaching out to my colleagues in Thunder Bay as well as Simcoe Muskoka to get a better understanding of what drove the use of the emergency break there. So I have a better sense of when it, you know, situation might meet the threshold and with the province might take action. I'm a bit suspicious the province would be open to using the emergency break now, given that it's only today that we're moving into the red region. And I get the sense that they would probably be hesitant to right away invoke it. Uh, once I've spoken to a couple of my colleagues, as I mentioned, I maybe have a better sense of you know, what that would be. I do intend though to share some of what I'm seeing here with the province so they are aware. And so hopefully they can share at least some of the concern that I'm having. And a follow-up, Ludwig? Uh, yes, thank you. And and on perhaps a lighter note, I, I do see that the list of uh, uh, healthcare outbreaks is uh, significantly short and now only two places uh, seem to be remaining on the list. 
Um, and I know the, the long-term medical health care uh, outbreaks have were a primary concern for you in the sort of early stages of the pandemic because that's where we saw a, a good portion of the deaths, almost everyone. Uh, so given that uh, you have had great success in vaccinating people there now and been able to close down uh, those settings, um, you know, out of concern fairly well, what, what is the next sector that you think needs to be put under the closest lens? Are we talking schools? Are we talking massive retails in, in regards to the variants? Like, do you, do you get what I'm saying? Like, you know, you, you were, you were tar really targeting and, and isolating the, the long-term care residents. So where, where do you think now the, the, the focus needs to be directed towards? Yeah, so, you know, with the long-term care and retirement homes, we saw probably around 80% of our deaths from COVID-19. And that's why it was such a priority for us to get vaccine into those groups to make sure that they were protected and we would stop seeing the unfortunate tragedy that we see in those homes. And, you know, I think when you point out that we only have a couple of outbreaks left in that settings, I think that's really we're seeing the impact of those vaccinations having worked even though we're seeing you know, a relatively high number of cases still in Niagara, you know, on the order of 20 per day, which is similar to what we are seeing all through the fall, unlike the fall, we're not seeing a lot of outbreaks. And I think that's because the vaccine is working to protect them. I think where we go forward, there's really two uh, groups that I'm particularly concerned about. So you know, in Niagara, while our deaths were 80% in the long-term care home and retirement home sector, if we actually look provincially, it's more only about 50%. And the next group that was passing away the most across the province was actually the 80 year old plus population that didn't live in long-term care homes. And so I'm quite concerned about that group. Uh, we've been lucky to largely protect them from infection, but if that doesn't happen this time around and it starts to spread in the community amongst that population, we could again see large numbers of deaths from COVID-19. And so it's an absolute priority that we're able to scale up to doing vaccination with that group soon. Obviously the province has prioritized the 80 plus group for vaccination and we'll have the registration system in a couple of weeks so we can hopefully get started on delivering vaccinations to that group soon and that'll hopefully protect them. The other group I'm thinking about is actually the group then that's just younger than that. And we're looking maybe like the 50 to 80 group. That group still relatively high risk of passing away. Almost all of the remaining deaths from COVID-19 have been in that group. I can see take out the long-term care homes in the above 80s. But more importantly, that's the group that actually tends to be hospitalized. And as I showed, the hospitals are already pretty full of patients. If we see COVID-19 spreading in the 50s, 60s, 70-year-olds, those are the groups that are going to be hospitalized. Those are groups that are going to be in ICUs. And that's going to strain the hospitals when they already are pretty full. And we've also seen through you know, both our waves of COVID-19 that the hospitals started to have outbreaks when they started to become full, when they became stretched, when they didn't have the same resources to be doing all the infection control, caring for all the patients, dealing with the surge of COVID-19, that started to stress them out and I think led to some of the errors that sometimes led outbreaks to start. And so I'm very also worried about that 50 to 80 group that we make sure you know, next up, we're able to start vaccinating them. So we're able to make sure we don't see that surge in the hospitals and we actually give a hospitals a chance to actually bring their uh, you know, number of patients down, the number of beds occupied down to a level that's sustainable again. All right, thank you, Ludwig. And Gord Howard, over to you. Hi, Dr. Herji and everybody else. Um, I think last week you had said to uh, one of our other reporters that you wouldn't wait for the provincial website to be online before moving ahead to hit that 80 plus population. Is there more you can say about how you're going to do that as far as how you would contact them and, and actually reach them with the vaccinations? Yeah, you know, I think how we reach the 80 plus population is really going to be pretty similar. It's going to be a lot of mass media. It's going to be a lot of, um, you know, working through this social services group, healthcare groups that already work with this population to encourage them to let the 80 plus people know that it's their turn to get vaccinated, encouraging them to sign up. I think that's really how that's going to occur. And that's whether we use a provincial system or in the worst case scenario, the provincial registration system isn't available and we're using an alternate system. Uh, our hope is that the province's registration system will be ready to go on March 15th, and I have confidence that it should be, just given that 
they have made a very big announcement of that. They have set that timeline and really the entire province is waiting on that timeline. So I expect it will deliver. It might have maybe a couple of features missing or something, but it will be there and it'll be able to let us start vaccinating because all of us are across the province will be relying on that system to get vaccinating. If by chance it turns out the system isn't available, we do have a couple of contingency options that we've explored so that we could launch registration in an alternate means. Those are much less preferred because if we do go down that road, there is a human resources impact on our end to actually operate, maintain those systems, man call banks for people who are gonna be struggling to actually work through the registration and have technical issues. And that's something we really don't want to do. The more people we have doing that kind of support to run in registration system means the fewer people we have actually delivering vaccines and the fewer people we have following up with cases and managing outbreaks, which I'm concerned are going to be rising in the coming weeks as we see the variants to, uh, start to rise. And um, um, just on the variants, I said it's risky, I'm sure, to project, but knowing that you're looking at the 33 now and the reproduction rate, like a week from now, where could we be at, knowing the 33 and that what there's 270 active cases today? Yeah, you know, I, the reproductive numbers thing every four and a half days you're doubling. So, you know, could we be over a hundred cases in a week? Maybe you know that doubling rate would imply that. I look towards the GTA, a place like Toronto, they seem to be doubling more close to every seven days. So maybe we are only doubling, so we're closer to 70. But I'm worried that we could be in that kind of realm where we've seen 70 to 100 uh, variant cases by that point. And the other key part is I showed the graph where day to day, the number of cases of variances seems to be increasing. And so they will start to increasingly be actually the majority of the cases of COVID-19 we're seeing. And that means the majority of cases are going to be spreading more quickly and it's just going to be this rolling snowball that's going to be very difficult to stop. So, so just Thanks, real quick, where in a week, where would that put us in total uh, active cases, would you guess, as it looks at the moment? Yeah, I don't want to really guess that. I haven't looked at the daily pattern of the active cases well enough to be able to project that. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, Steve from Kojiko, any questions? Yeah, I just one. Thanks, Dr. Hirji, and I hope everybody else is having a great afternoon. Um, Dr. Hirji, with all the new variants that are constantly, I guess, seem to be popping up, is there any concern that we might run into a problem with uh, a variant popping up that um, might not, um, vaccines that we've been promised um, might not help and, and we continue to actually stay in lockdown for, for longer. I know that might be not possible for you to ask, but is there any concern on your part um, about that happening? There's definitely a concern about that. Um, the small bit of good news here is that the B117 variant, which is the one that originated in the UK, seems to be about 95% plus of the variant cases we've seen in Ontario. And it looks like the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine are both pretty effective against that. And even the AstraZeneca vaccine, I haven't seen the formal data on it, but it's being used widely in the United Kingdom right now, where of course that variant is dominant. And it does seem to be working for them at least. So, you know, I'm hopeful that if the vaccine is maybe a little less effective, it's still very effective and it's gonna protect against that variant. The concern becomes more if we see one of those other variants, particularly the B1351 variant, which is the one that's originating in South Africa, where South Africa actually found the AstraZeneca vaccine was not working against that variant. And they actually stopped using the AstraZeneca vaccine and have switched all over, I think, to the Pfizer vaccine now. The best data we have is the Pfizer Moderna vaccine are still pretty effective against that variant. I know Moderna at least is working on a booster shot to make it even more effective. Uh, so we'll have even better protection with it. Um, so if we get the UK origin variant, hopefully we're probably okay. If we get the South African variant or the Brazilian origin variant, I think that becomes a bit more concerning because there is some more evidence that those might not work as well with the vaccine. A follow-up, Steve? No, that's great. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you so much and keep up the good work. Awesome, thank thanks. Uh, Paul, over to you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. 
Well, thanks, thanks, Doctor. I won't, uh, and Myrta, I won't keep you long. I just uh, wanted to get a sense from you on um, with the surgeon variants that we're seeing. Uh, is there a is there a real danger that your resources could be overwhelmed in terms of tracking? I imagine uh, deep dives into uh, looking at these cases and you know their origins would be key. Is that a real danger? That that obviously the hospital system could be overwhelmed, but in terms, I'm thinking of public health. Could your resources be overwhelmed? Yeah, they absolutely could be overwhelmed. And that's actually what we saw through the month of January when we were going through the second wave, where there just became too many cases that we weren't able to follow up in detail with them. In many cases, just a quick reach out, asking them to tell their contacts to isolate and really not following up further, not actually speaking directly with the contacts, not really learning what the full chains of transmission were to isolate people. And so if we do see that kind of you know increase in cases again, or what we've seen in other countries where that third wave is actually larger than that second wave, I think it could be even worse off in terms of that. The other part is that, you know, even if we manage to keep cases flat to where they are, it's important to note that we're not where we were in the summer where we saw zero to two cases a day. We're seeing, you know, on the order of 20 cases a day every day. And that does mean that we have staff who need to follow up with these cases. They need to follow up with those contacts. We do have several community outbreaks that we're following up on and helping to manage. And every staff person who's dealing with these cases or these outbreaks is a staff person who's not actually out doing vaccinations and getting vaccines to arms more quickly. And likewise in the hospital, if you know a small percentage of every cases we have become hospitalized and we're gonna see those hospitalization numbers going up, the hospital is gonna have more staff treating patients with COVID-19 in the hospital rather than having those staff out there delivering vaccinations to the public. And so I think it's a very big concern if we do see an increase in cases, a surge, a third wave, that it's actually going to slow down our ability to get vaccines out. Whereas if we do the hard work right now of trying to su suppress cases for just a little bit longer, that gives us a chance to get a lot more vaccines out. So then in a couple months, we can actually reopen with a lot more immunity out there through vaccination and actually can be a sustained reopening and we never have to worry about big surges of cases again. And a follow-up, Paul? Well, I guess it would be, would it be a, a natural uh, to ask uh, that you know, with going to red, you're already concerned. You would, I imagine, highly recommend that we not, at, in the near future, go to orange, right? Yeah, that's absolutely sure true. You know, I think we're about two weeks out as of tomorrow from moving into the gray level, and we've seen our reproductive number go from being in the 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 range to being 1.0. So, you know, at best, the gray level seems to have caused our cases to start flattening out and stop going down. And so, you know, I'm worried that moving to the red level may mean that our cases start to go up, especially since that variants underneath are just going to multiply and by themselves lead it to go up. And if we move to orange, that just supercharges that. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, so we have time to go back through um, again for one single follow-up question. Uh, so Penny, I'll turn it over to you. Do you have another question? I, I do. I, I was just actually a really quick one. Is the R rate available anywhere online? Uh, Dr. Herji re releases it to us when he talks to us, but it seems to me it's so important in tracking mm -hmm. where we're going, especially now with a variant. And I'm certainly not mathematician enough to figure it out myself. So is there anywhere we can find that? Yeah, actually on our website, if you go on to the stats page, that third page, which is called epidemiological it's a summary, I think, if you go there, we actually have a box showing what the reproductive number was for that day. And if you okay. scroll down, we actually have a graph showing since about April what it's looked like over time. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, Bonnie, over to you. All right, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, just looking to see other public health units have accelerated their, their vaccination plans to get that population 80 plus. Mm -hmm. um, I know you shared with us on Friday that Niagara was behind other public health units because we're lacking those vaccines. But if Niagara catches up, are you looking to develop a plan that's similar to other public health units and then offer that accelerated time frame to vaccinate the older residents? Yeah, it's our absolute desire to get to those older residents as soon as we can. 
The challenge we're dealing with is that we first got vaccines in mid-January, where some of these other regions had vaccines closer to mid-December. And so they had several weeks to work through the healthcare workers, get them vaccinated, whereas we got the slower start on them. And we're just catching up with those healthcare workers. The other part is that we actually have proportionally more retirement homes uh, than other parts of the province do. And so we're actually out there vaccinating those retirement home residents. And those are, of course, largely 80 plus residents, but they're ones who are not mobile and they're in settings that we've seen outbreaks. And if we've just got past the long-term care home outbreaks, we don't want to start seeing a bunch of retirement home outbreaks. We're hoping to finish that work off really in the next couple of weeks. And so hopefully not too much after the province's registration system launches on March 15th, we'll be running mass clinics by that 80 plus population. We're also hoping that if Niagara Health is able to work through the healthcare workers, which the province has prioritized before the 80 plus group, that they'll actually be able to transition just helping us as well with vaccinating that group. Okay, um, Richard, any follow-up questions? Um, yeah, so I know you said there, there's a potential to see more deaths with the general 80 plus uh, population. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, once we get them vaccinated, uh, you know, with these new variants, and it, it, is there a potential that another, another new variant could come? I mean, we've seen a lot of new variants in just a year, right? Um, so is, is that a worry? And at, at what point? do we kind of at what what point do we go you know what this is going to be mutating a lot like uh, is there any other option here that we that we that we look at like do we just kind of start hoping that we gather some herd immunity or, or what what's 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 the challenge there yeah you know I don't think herd immunity is a good option. Uh, we've seen some countries try to go down doing something closer to that. Sweden comes to mind, the United States comes to mind. And we've of course seen enormous numbers of deaths in those countries. I think Sweden is on the order of four to five times as many deaths as its neighbors in places like Norway and Finland and Denmark. They also saw much worse economic consequences of that with more, you know, when infection is spreading to the population, it does actually suppress your economy and seems to actually do worse for your economy than if you're able to keep COVID-19 under control with some economic restrictions. The United States, of course, they've you know, passed half a million deaths. They've seen more deaths than in World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War combined. And that's an all one year as opposed to the combined 12 or so years that those three wars would have made up. So I don't see herd immunity as a re, you know, really good option. And I think it's actually a really unnecessary option at this point because we have the vaccine, it's coming in larger numbers. We're only you know, a few months away from actually being able to get enough immunity through the population with the vaccine. Yes, maybe it's not gonna be as effective for some of the variants, but it'll at least have some impact. And we're also gonna see companies like Moderna are gonna be coming out with booster shots that actually better protect against some of the variants. So I do think you know, we, we're at a stage where we don't need to be contemplating things like herd immunity. We actually have a way to give immunity in a safe way, which is the vaccine. And we just need to hold out to get that done. Now, the concern about new variants popping up is very much a real concern. What drives variants arriving is just the random mutations that occur when a virus is spreading. Every time a virus infects you, it's basically multiplying in our bodies. It spreads to someone else, it multiplies in their bodies. Every time it multiplies, there's small random mutations that occur. And over the billions of you know, multiplications that happen, sometimes a variant emerges where it actually gets a mutation that actually makes it um, um, more adapted to be able to survive and spread more easily. And hence we end up with one of these variants spreading. The reason why these variants arose is really through the fall and winter in Western Europe, in North America, in South America, we were seeing a very high number of cases of COVID-19 and that allowed the mutations to occur and increase the probability that there would be a mutation that was adaptive that would allow the virus to spread more easily. And hence, we've ended up with these variants. It's not a surprise this is now when we're seeing the variants. It's actually falling right after the second wave because that wave actually creates the conditions where we can see variants emerge. And so if we do go down the road of not trying to prevent a third wave and actually suffer through another third wave, I, I am concerned that actually we could see more variants come out of that wave. And that would actually be a real shame. 
Whereas if we take the time now to keep things under control, to buy us time to get vaccines out, prevent cases from really getting large, we can actually get immunity and we can prevent variants and we can end up in a summer where we actually start to see things start to return a bit more close to normal and be past the point where we actually have to worry about big surges or new lockdowns. We, you know, I think we just need to be very disciplined over the next few months and we can actually avoid all of those things. Awesome. Um, um, and over to Ludwig now. Do you have a follow-up question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, I guess I'm just uh, overall curious as to, um, you know, when we're looking at a variant and the red zone, just to, just to confirm what you're, you, this, this spread that you think that the red level might cause, is that from people essentially just resuming their habits, going to restaurants now and stuff? Because you, you already have the Section 22 order prohibiting uh, people from outside households to, to be dining with each other. So, so could you talk a little bit just about what you think we might see in terms of is a community spread that you think might take hold or, or, or where, you know, what, what do you think the red level might, what behaviors do you think that might trigger? Thanks. Sure. So, you know, the way you prevent COVID-19 absolutely is if someone doesn't actually get in touch with anybody else. So, if you're staying home, you're interacting with your family, you're not interacting with anybody outside of your household, that's gonna be the safest way to keep COVID cases down and prevent any spread of infection. As soon as you start venturing out, you know, you're going to restaurants, you're going shopping, even if you're taking all the precautions, no precautions are gonna be 100%. There's always gonna be a risk that some infection is going to spread. And, you know, we've seen that exactly that. When we are in a lockdown state and everybody is staying home, we don't see infection spreading. When we open up a little bit, people start to go back outside and they're potentially interacting with others. We do see inspection start to spread a bit more. And, you know, we haven't pinpointed exactly which uh, interactions those are. Restaurants particularly were a concerning one. We did see a lot more spread because at a table where your masks are off, masks are off you're talking, there's going to be higher risk. And we did see that. And so the Section 22 mitigates that but it doesn't completely eliminate the risk that you are actually now out and about interacting with other people and there's gonna be potential of infection spreading. I particularly look to the fall where through November, December, we had many regions of the GTA in the red level and that didn't lead to their cases flattening out or coming down. Their cases actually continue to go up. And my concern is that we'll see the exact same pattern here where in the red level, we see what happened in other regions our cases start to go up and they keep going up. And that's not going to be sufficient to, to control the spread of COVID-19. The safest way to control the spread of COVID-19 is to, for everybody to stay home as much as possible. And that's why I really emphasize that point near the end that this, you know, given the province is going to be a reopening, I think we all need to take it upon ourselves now to stay home voluntarily. So we make sure we don't allow infection to spread despite the reopening that's occurring. Thanks Ludwig. Uh, Gord, do you have another question? Um, yeah, I was looking just for, we're down to two outbreaks now in long-term care homes and specifically Garden City Manor, they're into their fourth month now. Is there a sort of update I guess you could provide on, on how they're doing and is there any reason in particular they're doing, theirs is taking so long or is it just bad luck? Yeah, I think a bad luck is certainly part of it. Um, I think the design and layout of a facility can often make it difficult to manage an outbreak as well. If you have smaller hallways, you have more multi-person rooms, that obviously creates the risk of infection spreading. And I think Garden City Manor suffers for some of that. I do think there's probably some element though of their own internal infection prevention control practices haven't been as good as they could be. And you know, I don't wanna put them in the only one. I think that's true of lots of long-term care homes. Long-term care homes are not well resourced. They don't have any, you know, dedicated expertise in terms of infection prevention and control. It's really side of the desk work for everybody to get this done. I think we have seen a pattern though that there's definitely been some inspections when we've done a Garden City Manor where we do see issues with some of what they're doing. We follow up and it takes a while to get those corrected. And I think that is fueling some of the ongoing spread of this outbreak. They've of course had a few outbreaks over the course of the last year. And I think that's a reflection both of, you know, there's some things out of their control such as the physical layout of 
this facility that makes them more at risk, but perhaps also some of their own in internal ability and capacity to manage infection prevention and control. At this stage, with vaccines fortunately being out to the staff in the residents of Garden City Manor, we're not really seeing much in the way of cases, but we're not quite at zero cases. We're seeing you know, the odd case pop up every little while, so they're not quite getting that two weeks where there's no cases where we can actually say that that outbreak is over. We're hoping that day is going to come very soon, but it's not quite here yet. Okay, thanks, Gord. Um, and over to Steve from Kojiko. Do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, I do. Um, Dr. Hirji, with the AstraZeneca vaccine um, not being so effective with the Brazilian variant and the South African uh, variant, should it be delivered uh, to us here in Niagara, um, how do you... How do you and your team propose to, um, I guess, quell any pushback the public might have about not wanting to take that particular vaccine? Yeah, you know, I think that those are some of the downsides to the vaccine. There are upsides to the vaccine. That is a vaccine that we can actually store in a regular vaccine fridge. So it's a vaccine that can get out to pharmacies, it can get out to primary care. It's a vaccine that we're going to be able to make much more widely available to the public at large. And any vaccine is going to give you a lot more protection than having no vaccine. So that's one big plus. The other thing we've seen with the AstraZeneca vaccine is that actually after just the first dose of that vaccine, people actually have quite a strong immune response actually within a very short number of days. So it actually gives you very quick immunity. And so it'll be both quick immunity and immunity that is going to be more accessible to people. So I think what I would do is really focus on those elements. If hopefully the variants that we find out are circling in Niagara mirror that of the rest of the province, where it's the B117, the UK origin variant, I think we have the experience of the UK, which is very, very heavily using the AstraZeneca vaccine in finding it's having really good effect there. And that can be reassuring to the public as well, that it's gonna work for the vast majority of COVID cases that you might come in contact with or potentially be exposed to. And you know, it's a vaccine, it's available, and it's gonna give you some immunity. Okay, thanks, Steve. And Paul, finally over to you. Do you have another question? You're on mute, Paul. Is that? There you go. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Herji. Um, you mentioned the importance of getting needles in the arms of people 80 plus living in the community. Um, do you have any forecast on how long you think that could take? Yeah, um, you know, our internal forecasts are that we could probably get the vaccine delivered through that population in probably about four to six weeks. Um, that'll depend, of course, on vaccine supply as well as how many others that we have involved with vaccination. If you know the AstraZeneca vaccine comes, we're able to push it out to primary care pharmacies, that really actually speeds up our timetable. If it's really just us in public health delivering vaccines to that group, then we're looking at the longer end of that timetable. I should also mention the four to six weeks is to get a first dose into people. We'd have to go do the second round to get the second dose, but we know that first dose actually gives people close to 80% protection, which is really huge and actually would, I think, you know, stop a lot of the infections and protect a lot of people that. Uh, thanks again, and we will see you next week.